Can we get the, the lights on on this side? Okay, thank you. Why don't we pray uh, before we go into the message? Oh, I'll ask the children to, to go right now for the children's ministry. Uh, why don't we pray together? Oh Lord, we just ask for your word to speak clearly to our hearts. And we pray for the conviction that comes from your truth. Holy Spirit, we just pray that our hearts will be open, that our hearts will be humble, and that we will receive and be transformed by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. All of us here get angry. It's something that we all know how to do. We're driving and someone cuts in front of us and we get angry. We're tired, we're hungry, and someone gives us more work to do and we get upset. We plan a trip with our friends and our friends never show up. You know, there are times, uh, I don't know if you can relate, there will be times when uh, I'm really hungry and I go to the fridge, uh, I go to the refrigerator and I open the fridge and there's no food. And I get angry at the fridge. I, I, why is there no food in this fridge? And I don't know if, you, I don't know if you're like this, but I leave like, and then five minutes later I come back and I open the fridge again. You know, somehow expecting there to be more food in there, but again, there's no food in there. And, I get angry at the fridge again. Why is there no food in this fridge? Sometimes we get really angry. Uh, we get really upset. Maybe someone very close to you uh, betrays you. You really trusted that person and that person totally uh, stabs you in the back. Or maybe you lose someone. Maybe there's a tragic accident and someone dies and you lose someone very close to you and you get very upset. We all know anger. We all know little anger. We know very big anger. Uh, it's part of our lives. Anger can do a lot of damage. If you're someone who gets angry a lot, you, you know uh, the kind of damage anger can do. Anger does physical and emotional pain to people. And if you receive a lot of anger, there's a lot of hurt in you because of that. Anger can also be constructive. Anger is not just destructive. All of the greatest positive changes in history were because of anger. Someone looked at slavery and said, this is terrible. Slavery is a terrible evil. And they got really upset and they said, we need to do something about this. And they helped make slavery illegal. Someone was very angry about government abuse. How can the government treat people like this? How can the government abuse their power and they started revolutions. God the Father, He looked at our sin and He was very angry with our sin. And so He sent Jesus. So we know that anger can be destructive, but it's also constructive. We all know anger. We all experience it. Uh, we should also know anger is not sinful. Anger in and of itself is not sinful because God the Father gets angry. Jesus got angry many times. And when you read the Psalms, you know, some of you know we're going through a series on the book of Psalms. When you read through the Psalms, you see many, many angry Psalms. People are very angry in the Psalms. They're not all happy Psalms. They're some very sad Psalms and some very angry Psalms too. But what about when we face anger, like the anger that we see in this psalm. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to just read this to you. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. It says, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept, when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, willows are trees, uh, we hung up our lyres. Lyres are instruments. 
For there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Now, to give you all a little bit of background, uh, this song was written about the Israelites when they were in captivity in Babylon. Uh, so, to, to give you a little bit of historical background, the Babylon Empire was one of the most powerful empires at that time. They came to the Israelite people's main city, which was Jerusalem. And they came into Jerusalem, they destroyed it, they looted it, uh, they, they uh, stole from the temple. Uh, it, was, it was just complete destruction. And not only that, but what was worse is that the Babylonians took the best people from Jerusalem and brought them back to Babylon. So the Israelite people, many of them, became slaves. So this psalm that we just read, this psalm is remembering uh, the time when this person was a slave in Babylon. And as a slave in Babylon, the people who were in, in charge of him, they were mocking him. They were making fun of him. They were saying, Sing us one of those songs. You know, uh, you always say how your God is so big and so great. So sing us one of those songs about how your God is so faithful and how your God is so great. Sing us one of those Zion songs, you know, those songs from your, your homeland. So where is your great God now? Where is, where is that God that you love singing about? You know, don't you know that you are a slave? So is your God so great when you are a slave? And so they make fun of this person. Can you imagine the, the humiliation, the rage? I mean, I, I can't, I've never been in that kind of persecution before. But things only get more intense from there. If you, if you continue reading verses 8 to 9, the last two verses, he says, O daughter of Babylon, so he's talking about that empire, doomed to be destroyed. Blessed, happy shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. And blessed shall he be who takes your little ones, children, babies, and dashes them against the rocks. Now, the writer wants, number one, he wants his enemies to experience the same death the same destruction, the same humiliation and pain that he experienced. And then we get a visual of what he means. We get a graphic image of what he means when he says he wants them to experience what he experienced, which is when the soldiers came into the city of Jerusalem, they took the children, the babies, and they threw them against the rocks. <coughs> now this is terrible, terrible image. Uh, and it's almost hard to, to read this and then to say, this is the Word of God. But here's the problem also. Jesus tells us, forgive your enemies. Jesus tells us, bless those who curse you. But what is this? This is a terrible curse. He's saying, I want these people to experience the death of their children. That's not a blessing. That is the worst curse you could call upon somebody. And if we're honest, I'm sure that many of us here have experienced some kind of anger that was something like this, where we were so angry at somebody that we wanted them to experience terrible things. I'm sure all of us here have been so angry at some point that we want a terrible harm to come on somebody. We wanted them to be hurt. We wanted them to suffer. Now, maybe not to this extreme. Uh, I hope none of you have experienced tragedy to this extreme. This kind of tragedy comes from war. But we all know what it is to, to curse somebody, right? We all know what it is 
to want somebody to really suffer and experience pain. So what do we do? What do we do with, with this kind of uh, very difficult song? I know, I know some people want to say that the songs, you, know, you shouldn't really take them that seriously because the songs are just songs, they're just poetry, they're just emotional, right? So, um, you know, it's not, it's like if the book of John and Galatians and Genesis and Romans are, that is like the high level word of God. Then, you know, the Psalms are like kind of lower level. Like, you know, when you read Romans, you should really pay attention. It's theology. But when you read Psalms, you know, it's, it's just Psalms. It's just emotional. It's not as important. I don't know if you have ever felt that way, but I just want to show you something. And I know that for those of you who've been you know, going through the series with me, I've, I've mentioned uh, before about, I talked about the authority of the Psalms and right? how it's actually much more important than maybe we think. But I want to show you something. Uh, if we can put up the next slide. If we can put up the next slide. You don't have the slide? Okay. I thought, I thought we had the slide. Um, okay, it's, it's much, much less effective without the slide. But I will try to explain to you what this slide was supposed to show you. I had a slide that showed every single time that the New Testament referenced the Old Testament. And the slide had so many entries that it, when I put them all up on one slide, you can't read all entries because the entries are so small. There's so many. From the beginning, from Psalm 1 to the very end of the Psalms, there's references everywhere. Romans, Acts, Galatians, Ephesians, through the Gospels, Jesus references the Psalms all the time. It is many, 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 many more times than maybe you thought. Actually, the Psalms is one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. I don't know if you knew that. Maybe you thought it was Genesis, or maybe you thought it was Exodus. It's the Psalms. So what does this show us when we, when we look at how, uh, how many times the New Testament references the book of Psalms? What it shows us is that we can't ignore the Psalms. We can't, we can't say, well, you know, this Psalm is really difficult. It talks about killing babies, but you know what? It's just a Psalm. It's not Roman. So let's just kind of, let's just kind of ignore it, right? It's just, it's not really the Word of God. It's not, we can't, we shouldn't take it that seriously. But if Jesus used the Psalms to prove who he was, and if Jesus used the Psalms to make very strong theological points about God, and if he even pointed out word by word how important these words were that David talked about in the Psalms, if we take Jesus seriously, then we have to take the Psalms seriously. You cannot say Jesus is my Lord, but the Psalms, you know, I don't really know about the Psalms. You can't do that. If Jesus was very serious about the Psalms, we have to be very serious about the Psalms. So, you know, before we started doing this, this series on the book of Psalms, I'll be honest with you, when I read my daily devotionals, I used to just kind of skim through the Psalms. I wouldn't read the Psalms as carefully as I read Romans or Galatians or Ephesians or Corinthians because I just thought, well, these are the Psalms. Right? It is the Word of God, but I mean, I'm not dealing with very like, heavy theology here. But ever since I started doing this series and really began to study and go deep in the Psalms, uh, I'm pausing a lot more. I'm stopping for each word. I'm really trying to understand the emotions of the writers. Trying to fill my heart with the Psalms like Jesus filled his heart with the Psalms. So it's clear uh, we can't ignore the Psalms. It's very important. We have to let it shape us. We have to let it transform us, change our thinking, change our feeling. 
Now, as we look at the psalmist writings, I want to give you a definition of anger that I've used before, just so that we are all on the same page here. Anger is really about control. Anger is about control. You have a certain expectation and a plan, but what you want doesn't happen. That's why we get angry. I wanted food, but there was no food. I thought God would save me in this way, but it didn't happen. I thought I would have this job. I expected to get this job, but you didn't get that job. I expected my friend to treat me this way, but your friend doesn't treat you that way. Right? It is about control. The psalmist expected to be safe in Jerusalem, but he was a slave in Babylon. But isn't it also true that we get angry for different reasons? And there, there are different reasons that we get angry. Now, when I first came to Korea, uh, I've shared this with many of you before. When I first came to Korea, I thought it was really rude that Koreans never held the door open for me. So, uh, you know, I know it's very normal in Korea. Uh, you know, so I, I would walk in a crowd of people, like at the mall, and then you know, someone would walk in front of me, they'd open the door, and they would just walk through, and the door would hit me. Right? And I thought, that is so rude. Why? You know I'm right behind you. Why wouldn't you hold the door for me? And I thought Koreans are so rude. Uh, but then, living in Korea, Koreans would get upset with me, native Koreans. Uh, they get mad at me because I wouldn't wear suits. Uh, so I go visit somebody, and I wouldn't wear a suit when I visited. And they would be like, you're so rude. Don't you know they're supposed to wear a suit when you go to this event? Don't you know that you're honoring that person by wearing a suit? So they thought I was being rude. In both cases, there's a positive value, right? Courtesy, honor. And we all agree that's a good thing. You should honor and you should be courteous. Uh, but because we define that good value very differently, we get angry for very different reasons, right? So for me, I define good courteous, courteous behavior and honor as holding a door open. And natives in Korea, they define courtesy and honor as wearing a suit when you visit certain people. And because we have different definitions for what is good, uh, we get angry for different reasons. So let me just kind of sum it up for you. We get angry when we cannot control that something bad is happening to something that we believe is good. You get that? This is, this is what anger is. Anger is when you cannot control the fact that something bad is happening to something that you believe is very good. You can't control it. It happens even though you don't want it to happen. But our anger is very broken. It's very twisted because of sin. So what happens is we often get too angry about the wrong things. And we don't get angry enough about the right things. This is how our anger is broken. So if I get very, very upset that my day is ruined, I have these plans for the day and they're all ruined, and I'm so upset, I'm really upset about that. But then I turn on the news and I hear that for one, for example, immigrants in Korea, uh, they're dealing with racism, they're dealing with being abused by their bosses because maybe they don't have legal status, they're being taken advantage of. And you hear about that, and nothing, there's no anger. <coughs> All right, okay, that's, that's their problem. There's something wrong with their anger. It is inappropriate anger we should be much more upset about that injustice than about our one day being ruined. So do you see how all of us, we get way too angry about the wrong things and we don't get angry enough about the right things. Now, what is the psalmist in our passage angry about? 
He isn't angry that God didn't protect his home, Jerusalem. He's not angry about that. He's not angry that God didn't protect Jerusalem. He isn't angry even that he's being humiliated. In verse 4, what he says is, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? What is this? He's saying, I'm so upset that God is being humiliated. I am so furious that they are mocking. How, how can I sing the Lord's song? How can I sing a song to God? How can I dishonor God and play this song for their entertainment? How dare they ask me to do this to my God? Do you see what he's angry about here? And he says similar things about Jerusalem. He says, he'll never let, his, he'll never let himself forget about Jerusalem. And you have to remember, this is because Jerusalem was a home of God. It was a dwelling place of God. So for him, he very closely identified Jerusalem with God. So again, he was angry because God was being dishonored. Now, is it okay to be angry uh, if you're being humiliated? Is it okay to be angry if you feel like God isn't answering you? Yes, I, I don't think I don't think that's uh, a bad thing because even in the Psalms, uh, the psalmists are angry about those things. The psalmists express their anger this way. But I, I just want to kind of go deeper into this. See, if our anger is a response to something bad happening, to something that we believe is very good then the psalmist's anger is really amazing. See, what we realize when we look at this is that the greatest good in this psalmist's life is not his reputation, it's not his pride, it's not his safety. It, e it isn't even that God should do what he wants God to do. None of those things are on the top of his list of what is very good. Because he's not upset about those things. Again, I remember, he's not upset about his safety. He's not upset that God didn't fulfill his side of the deal. He's not upset about any of these things. He's upset because the very best, the very highest good in his heart has been diminished in some way. And that is the glory of God. The glory of God is his highest good. So he's saying, even if I'm humiliated, even if I lose everything, I lost my home, I lost family, I lost friends, I lost everything, even if I don't even understand God's plan, I don't know what God is doing. Why am I back on? I don't know. I can handle all that. That is not why I'm upset. But how dare they mock God? How dare they mock the glory of God? Do you see this? It is amazing, actually, what his anger shows us. I wonder how many of us get that upset that God's glory is being diminished. Now, let me say this. If we just left it here, uh, this is the same. I mean, if we just left it here and let it go on, if this was the, the end of the story, Actually, this is the source of religious terrorism. Christians have killed other people to protect God's honor. And today, we see terrorist groups like ISIS, uh, Muslim radicalism, they kill people for God's glory. They say, how dare you insult God? You do not honor God, so we're going to kill you. But here's a big difference. The psalmist, the psalmist, he doesn't ask God, give me the strength to kill my enemies. He doesn't say that. He says, I will give you my anger, God. He gives his anger to God. Now, this takes great faith. I, I know we don't often think about anger and faith together, but 
it takes great faith to give your anger to God because the more you trust that God is really a just God, the more you will really be able to wait and let God bring justice. If you don't really believe that God is truly passionate about justice, then when injustice happens in your life, you'll say, I need to take care of it. I need to show revenge. I need to get back. You're not going to wait. You're not going to trust God to do it in His time. You're not going to trust God to do it right. Ungodly anger wants control at any cost. No matter who gets hurt, I want it now. I want it right now. That's ungodly anger. Godly anger gives control to God. God, in your time, I'm furious right now, but I give you my anger. It's disciplined. It's self-controlled. It's patient. Godly anger waits. That's why it's so hard. We all want revenge. We all want to get back. Godly anger trusts God's justice. It waits. You know, even when the psalmist is at the very height of his anger in verses 8 and 9, he says, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you, who destroys you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones, again, the babies, and dashes them against the rock. You know, at this point, it is the most terrible, right? It is something that is very hard to read. But if you look closely, he only asks that the punishment equal the crime. Do to them exactly what they did to me. Not too much punishment. Don't go beyond what they did. I don't want them to just suffer, right? When we want revenge, we're not thinking about, I need to give them exactly this amount of punishment. No, we're, we're so angry, we're like, I just want to hurt this person, I just want to like lash out, I don't care how much I hurt this person, if I hurt them more, even better, right? He's saying, exactly the amount of punishment that they deserve. Also, report, don't punish too little. Right? He's not saying punish them less. He's not saying, like we, we often do, we say, oh, it's okay, you know, it's just a lie. Oh, you know, I'm just cheating a little bit. You know, everyone does it, everyone breaks these rules, everyone does these little sins, right? It's not a big deal, it's okay. You shouldn't be that upset about that. No, he's not doing that either. He's not saying it's not a big deal. He's saying give them the punishment that they deserve. Exactly the right amount. And that is also something that we are not good at. We are not good at giving the right punishment for the right crime. We often give too much punishment or we give too little punishment. So what he's saying is, God, God, be who you are. Be a God of justice. Do what only you can do. Be perfectly just. But isn't it true that we still have a problem? Jesus said, bless your enemies, don't curse them. He's still cursing them. Even if it's the right kind of justice, even if he's doing the self-control, he's still cursing his enemies. So, what do we do with that? Well, one important principle that you all need to know that is very important is uh, when we look at Scripture, Scripture only makes us responsible up to what we know. Scripture and God will only hold you responsible to what we know. So, for the psalmist, this was for him the most godly way of responding to injustice that he knew. This was the best way that he knew. He didn't know God's full plan for justice. He didn't, he didn't have the New Testament. He didn't know Jesus. Let me put it this way. The reality is, and the psalmist may not have really understood this, the reality is, when the psalmist 
in all of us, when we go to God and we say, God, we want justice. God, we want your justice. When we do that, not only are we condemning our enemies, but we are condemning ourselves. We are condemning our enemies to die, and we are condemning ourselves to die. I don't know if you ever asked God, God, why don't you bring your justice? I don't know if you really understand what you're asking for. If God is truly just, He will kill everybody. That is perfect justice. No one deserves to live. Everyone is sinful. No one is innocent. The appropriate punishment for all people is death. Because we have a perfect and holy God. But, on the other hand, we're on the other side of the cross and resurrection. We know Jesus. The cross, when we look at the cross, the cross doesn't say sin is okay. No, the cross says sin is terrible. It is evil. It reveals sin for exactly what it is. It is an infinite offense against the God who then took that infinite offense and required a punishment that only an infinitely glorious God could pay. On the cross, we see just how terrible sin is because only Jesus could pay for that sin. And God, who is both judge and the one who was judged, has made it possible for us to seek justice and yet also forgive. So when you look at the cross, you can see that justice and love can come together perfectly without any compromise. So for the psalmist, the psalmist, he knew no other way. He didn't know what the cross was. He didn't know that there was a way to combine love and justice together. He only knew God be just. The cross shows us that is not the only way. So how do we bless those who curse us? Uh, how do we deal with that, uh, that payback that we want to, you know, we, we get hurt, we experience injustice, and we're like, we need to pay that person back. I got hurt, so I need to pay that person back in exactly the same way or more. How do we deal with that desire we all have to curse our enemies? I want to share a, a little story with you. There was a small boy, a young boy who was always late for dinner. And this young boy, one day he came home uh, and his parents told him, on, the, on that night, please do not be late for dinner. Be on time. And as usual, he came late uh, and he came to the table and his parents were already eating dinner. He sat down at the table and he looked down at his plate and on his plate was one slice of bread and a glass of water. And he was silent. And he thought, this is my dinner. Ah, it's because I'm late. And he was so sad. He was hungry. But all he had was bread and water. And in that moment, his father uh, reached over to his plate, picked up his plate, put it where he was, took his own plate, which was full of food, and put it in front of his son. And his dad smiled at him, and they had dinner together. And this boy said, when I became a man, he said, all of my life, I've known what God was like because of what my father did for me that night. See, the gospel is about an incredible exchange. The father took his full plate, put it in front of his son. He took his son's empty plate and put it in front of himself. Who was the one who made a mistake? It was his son. Jesus became a curse so that you can become a blessing. 
Jesus received the payback. He received the wrath of God, the anger of God, so that you would receive God's pleasure, so that you would receive God's joy. You see, the reason some of us have such a hard time forgiving, have such a hard time letting go, the reason that so many of us have anger that is broken, our anger is too much for the wrong things and too little for the right things. The reason our anger is like that, the reason we hold these grudges against people and can't forgive, is because we don't believe we receive a lot. This is it. Forgiveness is very expensive. So if you don't have a lot in your bank, if you don't believe that you've received an incredible deposit of grace, then you can't forgive because there's nothing there. Because forgiveness is very expensive. But when you receive the forgiveness of God, there's, there's so much to give. You never run out. You see, the exchange isn't impressive. It's not a big deal if both plates are the same. I don't know what it looks like for you. I don't know when you think about the gospel, what is it that God has exchanged on your behalf? And is it something that is truly amazing to you, that you are every day amazed and blessed by, oh my gosh, that exchange, that is amazing that God exchanged that for me. When I deserve nothing, He deserved everything, and He switched it for me. Maybe for you, the plates don't look that different. Right? I had a little bit, I had a good amount, and God, okay, He just kind of added a little bit more, but you know what, I deserve more. Or He didn't really do that much for me. We have to understand the gospel in order to have power in the gospel. So my question to you is, what is it that Jesus deserved, and what is it that Jesus received? What is it that you deserve? What is it that you receive? You have to understand the answers to those questions. And it has to be at the very depths of your hearts. And this is where we find the grace to really give to others, not what they deserve, but what you receive. Giving them the grace you receive, the forgiveness that you receive, not what they deserve. It's not saying justice, is not a big deal because justice is completely satisfied. It's taken even further. It's hoping that that person is changed for the good by the love of God. And that is powerful, far more powerful than just justice by itself.